Hi, I'm Jim Kosmanek, and I'd like to welcome you to my home and studio in the charming colonial town of San Miguel de Allende in central Mexico. I've painted most of my life, but for over 10 years now, the main focus of my artwork has been in the medium of watercolor. For me, no other painting medium offers such stimulating challenges or is so visually rewarding, ah, but when well done. It didn't take me long to discover why transparent watercolor is considered so difficult. My first attempt seemed to lack the richness and clarity of color I admired in the works of masters, both those of the past and those of the present. In short order, I had lots of questions concerning paints and proper color combinations, questions that were unique to transparent watercolors. After searching existing books and videos, I uncovered very little information, so I began to research the answers to my questions. What I gradually envisioned on the somewhat irrepressible analytical side of me was a system for predicting clean color combinations that would apply to any color I might choose. My book, Transparent Watercolor Wheel, grew out of that four years of research, and this series of videos is yet a further evolution. I'm looking forward to this highly visual format because it will allow me to personally explore with you my watercolor wheel as well as some of the other factors that affect luminosity. This series is entitled Achieving Luminosity with Transparent Watercolor. Luminosity is the attribute that distinguishes a well-executed transparent watercolor painting from one using an opaque medium. It's a term that's often used, but perhaps how it relates to transparent watercolors is new for you, so let me try to define its use. When watercolor pigments are properly applied to the paper, light passes and refracts through the paint layer, then onward through the transparent external, reflects off the white paper, and returns through the external sizing and crystals of paint particles, illuminating them like stained glass. It's this stained glass effect that we call luminosity. Well, you should always be cognizant of what it will take to achieve the glow, and simultaneously what will destroy it. Throughout my research and experimentation, I became aware of the many factors that can affect luminosity. We'll cover the three most important in this video series. They're color mixing, water to paint ratio, and brushwork. We won't be covering subjects such as the physical properties of paints, paint additives, or paper selection. But since these subjects are covered in my book, I suggest you utilize it along with the video series as you explore the overall subject of luminosity. This first workshop video, Discovering Clean Color Combinations, will fully acquaint you with the transparent watercolor wheel, perhaps the single most important tool available for teaching you how to avoid muddy color combinations and how to consistently choose clean, luminous ones. We'll also do a series of exercises that will show you how to apply the theory, and I'll end up the workshop with a painting demonstration. All three videos in this series finish up with a demo where I apply the lesson just taught. On the second tape, called The Mysterious Juicy Wash Demystified, we'll tackle the seldom taught concept of water to paint ratio. In my classes, I found the majority of my students, including some who are advanced, don't understand how to properly suspend their watercolors. Either the wash is too watery and undersaturated, looking anemic, or applied too heavily looking like poster paint. Correcting this is simple. Create juicy washes and apply them properly. But what is a juicy wash and how do I know when it's properly suspended? The video on water to paint suspension is sure to ignite the bulb for you regarding what the masters refer to as the mysterious juicy wash. Years of practice can be cut down to a rained out weekend if you apply the instruction. We'll also be taking the technique well beyond the basics with exercises on floating in color to create extraordinary visual effects. Finally, we need to know how to properly place that juicy wash onto our paper. The third video, entitled Efficient Brushwork, Articulating Our Expression, will provide all the necessary information. Remember, no matter how transparent your combination of colors, 
you can't overwork the brush without losing some measure of luminosity. Color combines with the sizing and soaks into the paper. When the external sizing barrier is destroyed and the paper is saturated with color, the paper can't illuminate the paint crystals because it can't reflect light. This video will offer exercises to help you make your brushwork more economical. Use a lighter touch and reduce overworking by practicing patience. You'll see what I mean. Well, there's a lot more to creating a successful painting than simply paying attention to luminosity. But learning these basics one step at a time will remove many of the frustrating roadblocks in your path to creativity. You become a much better painter than you are today and more quickly than you ever thought possible. So let's move on to the watercolor wheel and see how selective color mixing can increase your chances for a mudless successful painting. Well, my research taught me that colors have characteristics that make them compatible in mixing or cause them to create terrifying puddles of mud. What you're going to learn isn't rocket science. In fact, it's so easy to understand you'll wonder why no one before me thought of it. Let's take a look at my color wheel as it appears in the book. This fold-out page is removable and makes a very handy reference guide in your studio. The full wheel has five rings. As with most color wheels, the colors are arranged on these rings in a counterclockwise order, running from yellows at the top through reds at about 8 o'clock, and then blues, greens, and then back up to yellow. This arrangement allows us to make color selections for complements, triads, and analogous colors as conveniently as with other wheels. But now we can choose the best color combination that suits our purpose and know that the wash when it dries will be radiant or in certain cases even dull if that's what you want. Two of the rings are subcategories, so for simplicity's sake, let's couple them with their parent ring. Well, if you learn how the three primary rings interrelate and understand and abide by the limitations, you can select color combinations with confidence. With just three rings, understanding the guidelines that govern color relationships is very easy. We're going to begin by looking at the three primary rings one by one. Let's take the innermost ring on the wheel where you'll find the transparent non-staining colors. And in order to make this as simple as possible, we'll combine it with the second ring of semi-transparent non-staining colors, forming our first primary ring, transparent and semi-transparent non-staining colors. The third ring on the full wheel is where the transparent staining colors reside. This ring will stand alone as our second primary ring, transparent staining colors. Now, combining rings four and five from the full wheel, we form our third primary ring, where the opaque and semi-opaque colors will reside, along with the whitened and blackened opaques and semi-opaques. They're all in the same ring. Keep in mind, the first primary ring is non-staining and the second primary ring is staining, yet both are transparent. The first major category is the transparent and semi-transparent non-staining group. Their pigments are very fine and are compatible with all colors. The only difference between these two is that the semi-transparent colors are slightly more opaque. The second major category is the one to watch out for. These transparent staining colors have been dubbed the devil colors by students. The pigments are so fine they bear the unfortunate idiosyncrasy of sometimes attacking other colors and staining, then dulling them. 